So I'd like to begin with, a, uh, with an ancient, uh, an old um, saying uh, by an anonymous uh, sayer, uh, that it's very difficult to find a black cat in a dark room, especially when there is no cat. Uh, so I think this is a quite apt description of how science progresses, that we spend a lot of time in dark rooms looking for black cats that have been reported to be there. The reports may or may not be reliable, as Ben Goldacre says, and occasionally we stumble on one and occasionally we don't. So this, I think, though, however, is a very different viewpoint than the public in general has of how science progresses, using uh, a set of rules and a recipe known as the scientific method for finding things out. But I think many of the working scientists in this room and elsewhere know that that's not really the case, that mostly what we do is something like this, uh, and we do it like that. And so the question is, however, how come it is that the way science is perceived seems so different from the way science is perused? And that was a question that, that I got interested in a few years ago, which led to this whole third career, as Peter points out, although I'm not sure I'd call it a career quite yet. It started because I have this dual role at Columbia University, where I'm both a professor, uh, uh, as a professor at Columbia University, where I both run a laboratory, studying the sense of smell, in fact, and also teach a class in neuroscience. Now, running the laboratory and talking with graduate students and postdocs and thinking up experiments to try and figure out how the sense of smell works, how the brain works, all these other things. Quite interesting, very challenging. It's a pleasure to do. It gets me in early, keeps me there late. It's quite exhilarating. But I also teach this course in neuroscience with the forbidding title Cellular and Molecular Neuroscience One. And it's, it's a big course, it's 25 lectures with a lot of information in it. And, and organizing that course is quite an interesting challenge as well. There's lots of information, you wanna get it organized, you wanna present a lot of facts, hang them on a few important concepts. But I have to say it wasn't really exhilarating. So what was the difference, I wanted to know. All right, so this course, uh, for which we use this, this well-known textbook, yes. Uh, Principles of Neuroscience, written by three eminent, or edited at least by three eminent neuroscientists at Columbia University, Eric Kandel, uh, uh, Tom Jessel, and the late uh, uh, Jimmy Schwartz. Um, this book is the te textbook for the course. It comes in at a hefty 1,414 pages. It weighs a little bit over seven and a half pounds. Uh, I should point out, just to give you a, an idea of the, the, the kind of the scale of this, that seven and a half pounds is the weight of two adult human brains. Um, this is a book about neuroscience. So I began to think that by the end of this course, by the end of this semester-long course with my lectures packed with facts and with this big encyclopedic books, that the students must have had two ideas that were completely wrong. One is that we knew pretty much everything there was to know about neuroscience, that's bullshit. And two is that the job of scientists is to do experiments, find things out, and then write them down in these encyclopedic books. And that's not the case either. When scientists like us go to meetings like the one we're all about to go to, we don't talk about what we know. We talk about what we don't know, what we'd like to know, what we'd like to find out. In short, we talk about the things that remain to be done, as was best said, I must say, by Marie Curie, who in a letter to her brother after obtaining her second graduate degree said, one never notices what's been done, uh, one only uh, pays attention to what remains to be done. And I thought, well, this is what's really important. It's what the remains to be done that we should be telling our students about. So I'm only, I have to make just a quick comment about this picture because one of my favorite pictures of Madame Curie, and I'm convinced that that glow behind her is actually not a photographic effect. It's <laughs> really there. So, it turns out, you know, her papers, her notebooks are to this day stored in a basement room, a basement vault in the uh, Bibliothèque Francaise. It's a concrete room, lead lined, and in order to go in there and study it, if you're a scholar, you have to put on a whole hazmat radiation suit. That's how hot the notebooks remain to this day. So I thought, well, okay, let's teach the students about what remains to be done. Let's teach them about the ignorance. Finally, something I know something about, I can teach these kids. And so I began this course about six or seven years ago at Columbia, uh, in which, we, which I called ignorance, in which we discussed what it is to, what a scientific fact is, how one comes about, how long they last, what good they are, whether there are limits to science, et cetera, et cetera. And the real core of the course, though, is that I invite members of our faculty, science faculty, and all the sciences, not just biology, to come in and talk to the students for a couple of hours in an evening about what they don't know, 
what they want to know, what they need to know, why they need to know this rather than that, why it's more important to know this rather than that, uh, what will happen if they get to know this, what will happen if they don't get to know it, what they knew, didn't know 20 years ago but do know now, what they didn't know 20 years ago but it's come undone now, all of these sorts of questions, the things that we deal with every day, in short, the, what remains to be done. I always joke it's kind of an interesting problem getting uh, the faculty to, in, to come to this class. I have to call people up and say, hello, Albert, listen, I'm teaching this course on ignorance. I think you'd be perfect. And it's, a little, <laughs> it's a little dicey at first, but they all say yes, and they all realize that indeed they are, that this is what they do, in fact, every day. So, of course, when I say ignorance, I use that term to be intentionally provocative because that's how you get students at Columbia to enroll for a course. But I don't mean the kind of ignorance with all the bad connotations. I don't mean simple stupidity or a callow indifference to facts or any of those sorts of things. I, I mean a kind of ignorance that I think was best uh, uh, identified by uh, James Clerk Maxwell, possibly the greatest physicist between Newton and Einstein, in which he said that thoroughly conscious ignorance is the prelude to every advance in science. This is, I, this is a critical idea, thoroughly conscious ignorance. So this, of course, is somewhat different than the way we often think of science, which is this huge pile of facts, this huge collection of facts. And indeed, there's good reason to believe so. I mean, the scientific literature grows, we all think, at an alarming rate, and that's true. Uh, last year, there was a, 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 sorry, the yearly growth is estimated to be about 2.5%. That means that last year, in 2012, nearly 1.6 million new journal articles appeared in the scientific literature on top of the approximately 50 million or so that are already piled up there. So it looks like quite a pile, but this is the accumulation model of science, and I think it's not the correct model. This is not really what makes science. As Blaise Pascal said, a house is more than a pile of stones, and certainly science is more than a pile of facts. So this leads us to think about the ways we think of science, the metaphors we use for science that I think are often quite wrong. So I'd like to disabuse you of a couple of them if you have them in your head. One of them is that as scientists what we do is we patiently put pieces of a puzzle in this big huge puzzle to come up with the final, the final picture as it were. Uh, I think this is clearly not true. For one, in the case of puzzles, the manufacturer has guaranteed that there's a solution. And that's certainly not the case in what we do, I think. We're not even really guaranteed that there's a manufacturer, it seems to me. So another model is that of uh, peeling away the excess, peeling away all the facts one by one like you would peel away the layers of an onion to get to some core truth, to get to some final answer. And then, of course, it'd all be over. I don't believe that's the way it works either. There's the always popular iceberg model, where all we see is a little bit of the top, but the vast amount of the iceberg, of course, is unavailable to us, unknown, unseen underneath the ocean. But this, too, carries with it the idea that there's a solid, there's a thing, there's, a, there's an entity, there's an amount of stuff that we can finally get to know. We could chip away at this iceberg, we could get to know it. Or we could just wait for it to melt, I suppose, these days as well, down to a size that we can find. But I don't think any of these models really work to tell you the way science really proceeds. The way I think it proceeds instead is perhaps the slightly more poetic model of ripples on a pond. Because as, it, as knowledge increases, as the inside of that circle increases and we gain more knowledge, it's also true that the circumference, the boundary that's in touch with all the ignorance around it also increases in size. And so that knowledge in some way actually increases our ignorance. This was maybe best caught in a, in a uh, quote from George Bernard Shaw, this was actually a toast that he gave at a dinner celebrating Einstein, Albert Einstein, uh, in which he said, science is always wrong, it never solves a problem without creating 10 more, which I find kind of glorious myself, and it's also nice for kind of job security. Um, <laughs> But he's absolutely right, of course, and it's not just that science doesn't solve a problem, it makes a new problem, it makes a new and better problem, it makes a new and better question. And that's really where science, the heart of science exists, I think. I should point out that actually uh, Shaw probably cribbed this from Immanuel Kant, the famous philosopher who about 100 years earlier came up with the idea of question propagation, that every answer begets a question. Of course, Shaw in his inimitable way up that by about an order of magnitude, but he's probably right, in fact, that we do get 10 new questions sometimes for every new solution.
So I would say to you that we should turn the arrow around here, perhaps, that the common way of thinking that we begin with some kind of ignorance or lack of knowledge and then we learn some things, we become more knowledgeable, that's true, but what's really critical is the other way around, that knowledge allows us to create better ignorance, because there's low quality ignorance and there's high quality ignorance. And this is, you know, scientists argue about this all the time. Sometimes we call them bull sessions and sometimes we call them grant proposals, but nonetheless, that's the argument. And it's really not just ignorance, of course, but it's questions, that knowledge leads to better and more sophisticated uh, questions, more important questions. Now, this reminds me of a story that I'll tell very quickly, an anecdotal story, because I think I have time to do it, about I.I. Robbie, the famous physicist who was a Columbia faculty member, one of the important discoverers of NMR. Robbie grew up a poor immigrant child in the Lower East Side of New York, and uh, he was fond of telling the story that when they came home from school, all the other mothers would ask his friends, uh, what did you learn in school today? But Robbie's mother used to say to him, so Isidore, did you ask any good questions today? Mrs. Robbie knew, because Izzy, he won the Nobel Prize. So, so I think it's important to understand that. So, I say to you that science and the arts and the humanities and any area of scholarship is really the search for better and better ignorance. An interesting uh, construct, an interesting idea that comes up in this, uh, uh, in this context is from the poet John Keats who coined the term negative capability, by which he meant, uh, picture John Keats, yes, John Keats the poet in a very poetic looking pose, I think, as well, I have to say. So Keats came up with this notion of negative capability, also in a letter to his brother, as it turns out. You should all write letters to your brothers, apparently. It's very important for posterity. Uh, in which he called negative capability as when a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, and doubts without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Now, scientists, I think, are kind of irritable often, and they do reach after fact and reason, but there's still this notion of being able to rest at some period, rest for some time with mysteries and doubts, because this is where the creativity arises from. This is where the creativity lies, not from what you know, but from thinking about what you don't know. And indeed, this very same idea was uh, updated, and for scientists by the physicist, and I guess you could say philosopher, Erwin Schrodinger, not quite 100 years later, in which he said, in an honest search for knowledge, you quite often have to abide by ignorance for an indefinite period. And I think this, this quality of abiding by ignorance is a very important quality that scientists learn as part of their career, but that does not often come off to the public. So this is where the problem starts. This is the problem side of the talk now. So let's say scientific progress in fact generates ignorance. Does that mean that ignorance equals uncertainty? Does uncertainty provide doubt? Does science then create uncertainty and doubt? Well, the answer to that is a resounding yes, I think. But, but, and this is the crucial point, I think. Uncertainty is not the same thing as unreliability. And unsettled science, most importantly, is not the same thing as unsound science. And this is where we have a problem, I think, with our a public perception of science. So let me try a quick story out, for example, on this. Do I have a... Did that go right? Yes, it did, okay. So this is actually from Isaac Asimov. So I, I, you may have noticed I like to quote people a lot. I do that really not just to give things more authority, which it may do, but because I think if somebody's had something good to say, the fact that they're dead should not let them out of the conversation necessarily. Um, also, I think it's important for us to know that the conversation's been going on for a long time. I didn't invent this, we're not inventing it now, we're just participating in an ongoing conversation. So Asimov, in response to somebody who told him that science is wrong a lot and what do we make of it and all that, said, well look, you know, there was a time when people believed that the earth was flat. And that, of course, turns out to be wrong and eventually we realized that was wrong and thought that the earth was spherical. But that's actually wrong also. The, the earth is really something called an oblate spheroid, which means it's a little wider at the equator and a little shorter at the poles, like some of us are. Um, but, 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 says Asimov, if you, think, if you think that thinking the earth is spherical is just as wrong as thinking the earth is flat, then you're wronger than both of those ideas. Because even though the spherical earth is an unsettled idea, not a finished idea in science, it's still righter than a flat earth. And that's the way it is for a great deal of science. So a good example, I suppose, or an easy example, is the climate issue now, which seems to be unsettled in some ways, or there are nefarious um, 
uh, entities who would like to believe it's unsettled. But you see, the reason is because scientists, when they talk about climate change, only talk about the part of it they don't agree on, about 2% of it. 98% of, of the climate change issue is widely agreed upon. But we don't talk about that. That's not what scientists do. Why talk about what you know? That's kind of boring. So we talk about what you don't know, but then the public only hears about the stuff that we don't know. So where do we get this from? So the notion is that the values of science are fact, surety, conviction, things like that, but really it's ignorance, doubt, and uncertainty. Now, this becomes important in an area like the public understanding of science or the public awareness of science, citizen science, all of these phrases that have become kind of catchwords today in which we would like the public to have a better understanding of science, know more science somehow or another than they do so they can make a more informed decision. Nothing wrong with that, but I think it leaves out an essential ingredient. It's not that they should become experts like a scientist is, or even know some half-assed science or something like that. It's rather, the, oh, sorry, I was going to tell you that there are a whole lot of conferences and things devoted to this issue too. But it's rather, I would say, that ignorance and doubt as creative principles in science can not only be the possession of an elite trained scientific group. It cannot just belong to scientists. This notion of ignorance, and I think there are probably few scientists in this room who would disagree with me that this is what we do, but this notion cannot just belong to us. It has to be communicated to the public as well in some way. And so where is the problem? Well, of course, the problem is that in a world full of facts, where facts are so easy to come by with Google and Wikipedia and the like, we have to begin training students in our educational system to have a taste for the unknown, to have a taste for what's outside the ripples there, to have a taste for questions and for revision and for an understanding that this is where the really important stuff goes on. This is not so easy because we currently have what I'm fond of now calling the bulimic model of education. Yes, that's puke up there. So the bulimic model of science education is that we take a lot of facts, and we cram them down some poor kid's throat, and then we move them over to a test where they get to puke it all up, and then they go off to the next trough with no appreciable gain in anything, it seems to me. So, so this is a model that's kind of a disaster. It's not only a disaster because it's not the right way to learn anything or to teach anything, but it also produces a dangerously distorted view of science as a pile, a collection of infallible facts, rather than what it is, which is a constant chase after mysteries and, I would say, ignorance. <laughs> So the problem is we have this now, this educational system that's quite efficient, it seems, at making uh, science maximally distasteful to the largest possible number of people. Um, in the second grade, all the kids like science, the girls and the boys. They're curious, they're inquisitive, they like to play around, they like to go to science museums, but by the 11th grade, fewer than 10% have any interest in science at all, let alone going into a career in science. Is this what we want? Clearly not. And, but I use this phrase from the geneticists who say you always get what you select for, but that's of course meant as a warning. Um, yes, you do get what you select for genetically, but you also can get what you select for <laughs> culturally, if you will. And so I think we have to change our idea. <laughs> Sorry. We have to change our ideas about what we want out of an educational system and what we want to put into it. Now, that's a long discussion, one which I find my time has been expired for, so I won't go into that today, but I hope that it brings some things to your mind about what we need to change in our educational system. The, the focus needs to be not on facts, but on questions. Um, I'll end with a quote from William Butler Yeats, education is not filling buckets, it's lighting fires. So I'd say to you all, time to get out the matches. Thank you very much. <laughs>